Thank you for showing up. Um, today we have Dr. Jonathan Eisen with us, and he's going to be our keynote speaker. We're very happy that he could come out and speak to us today. Um, he got his PhD from Stanford under Philip Hanawatt, studying, uh, let me see if I can read what I wrote here, um, <laughs> studying uh, DNA repair gene families before he moved on to the Institute for Genomic Research and had an adjunct uh, position at John Hopkins. He's now at Davis, uh, cross-listed in their Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, which brings, us, uh, brings him here to us, as well as in their School of Medicine. Um, his work primarily focuses on uh, the microbiome, as you can see here, on microbial organisms and the evolution of novelty um, in microorganisms and their interaction with specific hosts, like plant hosts. Um, and today he'll be talking to us about phylogeny-driven approaches to studies of microbial and microbiome diversity. So thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, and thanks for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to try and do something a little different than I normally do because this is the graduate student symposium and I was invited by the graduate students. So. Uh, I'm going to try and go through some lessons I, I think I've learned. I probably don't actually, I probably haven't learned anything, but um, I will pretend that I've learned some lessons. Uh, the first lesson I want to convey to you is to go with your obsessions. Now, if you um, know something about me, you know probably that I'm obsessed with many things. One of them is open science, I'm heavily involved in the Public Library of Science. Um, my brother was one of the co-founders of the Public Library of Science, but that's my license plate, ha. Huh? Um, pumpkins and so on. Um, I'm not going to talk about that in detail, but I'm happy in conversations during the breaks and things to talk about open science related activities. I'm also heavily involved in communicating science and experimenting with social media tools, blogging, Twitter, etc. I'm not going to talk about that in detail. Um, not that it matters here, but um, many other people know I'm obsessed with the Red Sox. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, amazingly, uh, <laughs> I am going to talk about something that I didn't realize was an obsession of mine. So this is a ninth grade English paper that I wrote where you could write your own question and I was such a dork um, that this was, look at that handwriting too by the way, um, that this was the question that I invented to, to answer and then answered. I don't remember this literally at all, but um, somehow my parents were scientists but they didn't work on anything like this. I have no idea what got me interested in this. But that is what I'm going to talk about, and I'm also going to try and weave in to this conversation another really important lesson, which is that history matters. And I'm going to talk about history of species, phylogeny of taxa. I'm going to talk about history of genes. And I'm also going to talk a little bit, because again, because it's the Graduate <laughs> Student Symposium, a little bit about history of people and history of science um, and that it matters. And I thought I would start off um, you know, with a confession, I guess. Um, I was pretty lost in graduate school. I went to Stanford to work on butterfly biochemical evolution and it um, didn't work out and I did rotations in many, many, many labs um, and eventually ended up in this DNA repair lab and I, it seemed like a really interesting thing but I, I needed to, as, a, as being interested in evolution and ecology, it didn't fit perfectly well with a lab studying the cellular mechanisms of DNA replication and repair processes. So I felt like I needed some guidance um, I got that guidance from the Tree of Life. That was my map. Um, and so this is, you know, the classical three-domain ribosomal RNA Tree of Life from Carl Woese. And what I did was ba I basically asked, okay, where are the gaps in studies of DNA repair? Um, most of the studies of DNA repair processes had been in a couple of species of bacteria, a couple of species of eukaryotes. And I went through sort of the Tree of Life and said, where are there holes in this, where might it be interesting to study DNA repair processes? And I flagged a bunch of lineages that seemed to be interesting in a variety of ways by their evolutionary novelty or by other processes. And I spent a few years working on this, doing um, a variety of studies of cell biology of DNA repair in these organisms. In particular, I focused on halophilic, um, halophilic archaea. There were very few studies of DNA repair and recombination processes in archaea at the time, and the halophiles were really interesting because they tend to grow in incredibly high UV radiation locations like evaporating salt ponds, and so I worked on UV resistance and DNA repair processes. Um, so basically, I, I think that, that worked out okay, um, and I think an important lesson for graduate school is um, 
you know, there's a lot of pressure to work on things that a lot of other people are working on because that's what's funded, that's what, you know, is obviously of interest. There's also a good idea to try and find where the gaps are, where, where people aren't studying something. And I think that that's a useful thing to think about when you um, plan your graduate career. And what I'm going to do is just give you an example now of, so, so what I've done in most of my career is try and take this general approach, taking phylogeny, like the tree of life, and using various aspects of analyzing the phylogeny of species or the phylogeny of genes or the phylogeny of genomes in some way and applying that to studies of microbial diversity and microbial communities. And I'm not going to tell you the whole history and details of this. I'm going to give you just a few examples to give you a taste of why I think phylogeny matters. So I'm just going to give you this one example, which is uh, the latest work uh, that's been published um, from my lab. We have a collaboration with um, a Rice Biology Lab at UC Davis, um, this Professor Sundar and this amazing graduate student of his, Joseph Edwards, and then a few people in my lab and a few people in their lab collaborated on this project to go out and study in the field and also in the lab uh, different varieties of rice and how they associate with communities of microbes on their leaves, on their stems, on their roots, and in the soil around them. And so basically, Joseph and people in the lab collected um, samples of the rice and then brought them back to the lab and grew them in soil in the lab and did um, reciprocal transplant experiments and common garden experiments and also then dissected the plants and looked at the microbial communities on the plants. And there's lots of work in this area now, so-called microbiome work on different organisms. I'm not going to tell you all the detail of this, I just want to use this as an example of how phylogeny matters. So you may or may not be familiar, but most of the work now being done on characterizing microbial communities involves isolating DNA from the environmental sample and running PCR amplification of ribosomal RNA genes and then sequencing of those ribosomal RNA genes from the sample. And this is very powerful in particular if you use phylogenetic analysis of the resulting data because you can, this was originally launched. Um, in the 1980s by Norm Pace and colleagues, but you can go to an environmental sample, extract the DNA, sequence the ribosome RNA genes from those organisms, build an evolutionary tree, and that can tell you what organisms were present in the sample that you got the DNA from. And you can count how many copies of each ribosome RNA you got and estimate the relative abundance of different organisms from the sample. And this phylogeny of the ribosome RNA is called phylotyping and is critical to interpreting this type of environmental data to place these sequences from unseen organisms into an evolutionary context. And that's um, what I've been working on in my lab for now, actually since I was an undergraduate um, for many years, is the ways to do this and the way to analyze that type of data. We've worked on a lot of different techniques in my lab. I'm not going to tell you about all of them in detail, but we've tried to integrate the laboratory studies with computational work. and adapt to the changing landscape of sequencing. As sequencing got easier and easier and easier, we had to redesign our computational methods to become more automated and more high throughput. And so we've had a lot of people in the lab that have designed a variety of methods to analyze this type of data. We have a whole suite of publications about this. Um, and this is going to be one of those lessons uh, learned for everybody here. Um, in the RICE study, we didn't use any of the tools developed in my lab. <laughs> um, we ended up using uh, this amazing suite of software tools uh, embedded in a program called Chime developed by Rob Knight in his lab. Um, and it's a package to allow you to do take sequences, analyze them, cluster them into taxonomic groups, uh, identify the taxonomic groups, and then do what is another really important part of phylogeny in studying microbial communities, which is what's generally called phylogenetic ecology. So if you want to compare two samples to each other, like people have been doing with plants and animals for a very long period of time, you can make a list of the taxa in the two different environments and compare the presence and absence of those taxa between the different environments. But there's been a big movement in plant and animal ecology for many years to integrate the phylogenetic relationships among those organisms as part of your comparison between communities. So if the organisms are more closely related to each other between two communities, you would count that as a smaller difference between the communities than if they have big evolutionary differences between the communities. And there's a tool for doing this that a lot of microbial people use, also developed by Rob Knight's lab, Kathy Losapone, called Unifrac. It's embedded in this Chime package and it allows you to calculate 
a distance between two communities based upon the shared phylogeny of the microbes in those communities. Um, so the lesson here is, except when you're defeated, um, I like all the tools we've developed in my lab. They're all open source and freely available and um, chimes better. Um, so, <laughs> you know. Um, so basically what we, what we did was, or what Joseph did, was take all of these samples and then ask questions about the biogeography within individual plants, comparing different parts of the plants and then different distances from the roots to the soil and looking at the microbial diversity in these samples. And by doing this unifrac based distance, you can cluster samples by their phylogenetic similarity to each other and see, for example, that different parts of the plant, wherever you get the plants, whatever the soil that they're grown in, the root samples cluster together. The stem samples cluster together. The leaf samples cluster together. So there's some signal about the part of the plant, regardless of the genotype of the plant or the environment where you find the plant. You can do the same thing by looking at the genotype of the plant now in common garden experiments or reciprocal transplant experiments. You can try and tease apart the effect of the genotype. And again, by comparing the phylogenetic structure of the communities, you can get the genotypes splayed out upon these principal component axes. And you see that the different genotypes have some signal that is the microbes associated with those genotypes are different than the microbes associated with another genotype. Cultivation site also has an effect on this. So where you're growing the plants and what soil they're in does uh, impact what microbes show up associated with their plants. You can um, scan through the data, which I'll come back to in a little bit, using genomic data or random sequences from the environment, so-called metagenomic data, and do the same type of analysis with functional predictions that you would do with taxa. I'm not going to talk about that in detail right now, but again, using a phylogenetic perspective is seems to be the best way to tease apart um, this type of data. And you can also, you know, so microbiome studies have been revolutionized by cheap sequencing. And now you can imagine doing time series, doing biogeography, doing all sorts of genetic effects, but embedded in almost all the analyses that people are doing is phylogeny. Phylogeny of the sequences and phylogenetic ecology comparisons of the communities between them. Um, so again, I'm not going to tell you about all the sort of microbiome studies we've been doing, but um, this one was based largely upon ribosomal RNA analysis. And another important lesson to realize is that any analysis that you do, any sort of focus that you have, it's not going to be perfect. And there are many reasons why ribosomal RNA-based analyses of communities are not the perfect only thing you should do about um, communities. One of them that a lot of people have appreciated that phylogeny can also help you tease apart is that the copy number of ribosomal RNA genes varies between taxa. And if you try and use the counts of sequences that you get from a community to estimate relative abundance of organisms, that's biased by the differences in the number of copies of those genes between the different cells in your environmental sample. And we actually, in collaboration with this guy, Steve Kemble, who's now a professor in Montreal, uh, when he was a postdoc in Jessica Green's lab, developed a phylogenetic contrast-based method, taking this Felsenstein phylogenetic correction of correlations and applying it to ribosomal RNA copy number. And you can correct the estimate of relative abundance from a community if you have information about the phylogenetic distribution of copy number across the phylogeny of the species from which they come. Now, um, ribosomal RNA is imperfect for many other reasons. One is that we would like to predict functions in communities, and ribosomal RNA is not uh, perfect for that. So a lot of people have turned to going to environmental samples instead of doing PCR, sequencing random genomic data that you extract out of the community and sequencing that and then trying to analyze the data. Turns out you can do the same type of analysis as ribosomal RNA with this random data and do phylotyping from the community. And it turns out this is probably better than using PCR amplification data for a couple of reasons. First of all, there's no PCR. And second of all, you can analyze genes that don't vary in copy number between taxa and try and get a better estimate of the relative abundance of organisms. So I've been, uh, another one of my obsessions has been uh, trying to shove DNA repair studies into evolutionary studies. And I found that um, when I was a graduate student that this one DNA repair gene was a really good phylogenetic marker for taxa. Just like ribosome RNA, it doesn't matter what gene it is, but it's the Rec A recombinase. Um, and so I said, okay, we're getting all this metagenomic data. 
No one had been able to get Rec A from environmental samples before because it didn't PCR very well. What if we analyze Rec A from the metagenomic data? Does it give us a good picture of microbial diversity and uh, phylogenetic diversity? And it turns out it does, as do many other protein coding genes. You can scan through genomes and find we found a list of about 30 to 40 good protein markers that are useful for phylogenetic and phylogenetic ecological studies of microbial communities from metagenomic data and are probably better in principle than ribosomal RNA uh, if you can get the data from them from metagenomic data. Um, you can analyze them in the same basic way doing phylogenetic ecology or phylogenetic diversity metrics, but again, because of the low variance in copy number and also because there's third position variance that allows you to distinguish close relatives from each other. These protein coding genes work a little bit better. And so again, my lab has worked a lot on developing the methods to analyze this. The latest thing um, that we've been working on is a program called PhiloSift. It was developed by Aaron Darling originally when he was a postdoc uh, in my lab, and he's now a professor in Sydney, and we're continuing to try and co-develop it with him. And it basically does the chime-like analysis for protein coding genes from environmental samples and allows you to do taxonomy and phylogenetic ecology of all these other genes in addition to ribosomal RNA. Um, you can use this to build whole genome trees from concatenating the alignments of all these sequences. There's a suite of markers that we have for different taxonomic groups. We've been refining this. We now have uh, zoomed in on particular phyla of bacteria and for some of them we have hundreds of phylogenetic markers that can be applied to them from environmental samples. And probably the best thing about um, PhiloSift is it embeds this program from Eric Matson for doing um, the, the plots that I showed of the rice where we splayed out samples on this principal coordinates and you can separate samples from each other by their evolutionary distance. One thing that's missing from that is it doesn't really tell you which branches in the tree account for those big differences between the samples. And what Eric developed was a tool called Edge PCA, which you probably can't see it here, but it'll label the actual branches in the phylogeny that are most responsible for the distance differences between samples. And then that allows you to go back in and follow up with experimental studies of those taxa or those protein families. Um, so even though Chime did defeat us completely, uh, I refuse to accept that we're completely defeated and we're still developing PhiloSift as this sort of protein marker-based approach. It's also different in for the phylogenetics people, it's a Bayesian approach as opposed to other methods. Um, so no, you're never, you never defeat it. Don't accept that. Um, uh, so um, that's just sort of giving you a taste, a fast taste of how we can use phylogeny to analyze this sequence data that's coming out and focusing on the phylogeny of taxa, species, genus, g genera, orders, etc. Another thing that's really useful is to apply evolutionary analyses to the study of function of genes. Um, and if we go back to my um, graduate uh, school time, so I was doing this work on all these different organisms from across the tree of life, and one of the things I was trying to do was use degenerate PCR to clone out DNA repair genes from these weird extremophiles and other organisms in order to try and understand whether or not they had the same suite of processes found in E. coli and yeast and humans. And so I'm struggling away with this degenerate PCR, and then this guy, Hamilton Smith, came to Stanford to give a talk. He was collaborating with Craig Venter on sequencing the first genome of any free-living organism, and he presented this data. And then he presented a table of the other genomes that Tiger was sequencing, and it was all of the ones that I was trying to use degenerate PCR to clone out individual DNA repair genes. They had the whole genomes of them. And I said some words I'm not going to repeat here. Um, and. Uh, realized I probably should shift a lot of the work that I was doing in the lab. So uh, if you um, can't beat them, uh, the first thing I did was I critiqued them, uh, and then I joined them. I got a job at Tiger and spent eight years there working on sequencing and analyzing genomes. Um, the way I critiqued them was to point out uh, that they, when they were sequencing these genomes, they were trying to predict the functions of all the genes in the genomes. And the main way that they did it then, and even the way that many people do it now, is to take each sequence of a gene from your organism of interest and do a database search scanning your sequence against the database to look for the sequences that are most similar to your sequence from your organism. A metric of similarity with BLAST, for example, or some other database search tool. And then if you got a hit, you would look at the list of hits ranked by their similarity and look at the function 
of the top hits. And if the function of the top hit was known, you would pull that function and annotate your sequence based upon that function. And what I showed in a series of papers was that, uh, how to be polite, that this was kind of stupid, um, that it was not integrating the evolutionary relationships among the sequences in the database. And it was much better to take the sequences in a gene family, including your new sequence, build an evolutionary tree of those sequences, overlay known experimentally determined functions onto that tree, and then predict the, un the functions of the uncharacterized genes using standard evolutionary character state reconstruction methods that are used for paleontology and physiology and morphology and so on. You can do the same thing for protein function to predict unknown functions, but if you have a phylogenetic context, it's much better than if you just do individual pairwise comparisons and rank by similarity. I outlined a method to do this, a general approach that I called phylogenomics for building these evolutionary trees and integrating that sort of phylogeny of sequences in the prediction of function. Um, another lesson is uh, if you invent your own omics word, which I did, um, you're stuck with it. So now my blog is phylogenomics at Blogspot. My Twitter is phylogenomics. My lab page is phylogenomics, blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, I don't think I defined the word really well. So I defined it as being uh, using genome evolution to predict functions of genes. And there's actually better uses of the term phylogenomics for fully integrating sort of genomic and evolutionary reconstructions. But anyway, I'm stuck with the omics word. Um, so this may sound a little bit familiar to you. Um, that's because what I was doing with phylogenomics was directly copied from what people were doing with ribosomal RNA sequencing. What people were trying to do with ribosomal RNA sequencing was identify an organism based upon its ribosomal RNA sequence and then predict the biology of the organism by where it sat in an evolutionary tree related to other organisms for which the biology was known so-called phylotyping. And that's exactly what I was doing here, except I replaced organism with protein family. Um, and it's the same principle. Um, so lesson 10 is uh, stealing is good, as long as you say where you got the idea from. Um, and so phylogenetic-based functional prediction is basically a direct extension of phylotyping for characterizing microbial communities. And we've uh, and many other people now have used this phylogenetic approach to predicting function in a diversity of ways, uh, shown generally that it's a better approach than these pairwise or similarity-based predictions of function. I'm just going to show you one example of this. When um, Craig Venter uh, got funding to sequence, uh, do the first large-scale metagenomic sequencing from a complicated environmental sample, this Sargasso C uh, sample, at the same time Jill Banfield and the Joint Genome Institute was doing the first, um, uh, the, the other first metagenomic study. Theirs was a slightly simpler sample, but these were the two sort of first examples of doing large scale metagenomics from uh, uncultured organisms. I decided to scan through the data to look for homologs of this really interesting gene called proteoridopsin that Ed DeLong and colleagues at Ambari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, had discovered from sequencing large DNA pieces from uncultured organisms. And what we found in this one Sargasso C sample was an incredible diversity of these proteoridopsin-like genes. The proteoridopsin is a light-mediated proton pump. Uh, that was the one that Ed DeLong discovered, and it's homologous to these genes from the halophilic archaea that I had been working on, um, that many of the halophilic archaea have homologs of these genes. One is a <coughs> light-mediated chloride pump. One is a sensory uh, um, molecule. They have a bunch of different functions. And so we scanned through the proteoridopsin data from this shotgun sequencing and found an incredible diversity of sequences likely, you know, corresponding to, um, you know, many different subfamilies of proteoridopsin. And at the time, we had no idea what the functions of these were, but they certainly showed up in different clades across the evolutionary tree, and you might at least hypothesize that they could have different functions from each other. But we didn't know at the time uh, what those functions were. So I'm going to switch um, a tiny bit to a different aspect of functional prediction. So um, this phylogeny-based functional prediction works pretty well, but it only works if the homologs of your gene of interest, if some of them have been experimentally characterized. And you build an evolutionary tree, and then you look at 
the relationships among organisms that have been experimentally characterized. Now it turns out most genes that we find now in genomes and environmental sequences, most of their homologs, and in fact in some cases all of their homologs, have not been experimentally characterized. So this phylogeny uh, doesn't really help you at all in those cases, or my phylogenomic approach doesn't really help you in those cases. But there's a really interesting method um, that does help you. And um, this is a method which you could basically say it's, it, it analyzes who the genes hang out with. Um, and it was originally developed by, uh, developed in detail by um, Pellegrini and Eisenberg at UCLA, and it's called phylogenetic profiling. And I'm just going to show you a quick example of this, that um, it's a really powerful way to take into account comparative and even phylogenetic information. So we sequenced this genome when I was at this tiger place, this Genome Research Institute. It's a really interesting thermophilic organism related to the spore-forming Clostridia and Bacillus anthracis. Produces hydrogen as a byproduct of, meta of its metabolism. That's why it was being studied, funded by the Department of Energy. They didn't really care about um, uh, its relationship to anthrax or these spore-forming organisms. But when we annotated the genome of this organism, we discovered something uh, somewhat surprising. Our collaborator, knowing what it was related to, had been spending years trying to get it to form these endospores like Clostridia and Bacillus anthracis do, and was unable to do it. And yet, throughout the genome, we found lots of homologs of these spore-forming genes uh, in the genome. So we went back to our collaborator, this guy Frank Robb, and said, can you, can you try again? Um, and he tried a bunch of new methods that he had not really tried before, and he got, actually got it to form these endospores, just like in Bacillus anthracis. That's not why I'm telling you this story. The reason I'm telling you it is because um, this organism is not that closely related to anthrax or the clostridia for which um, sporulation had been studied. It's in the same phylum, but it's reasonably distant from within that phylum. And we had seen this description of this method called phylogenetic profiling and thought it might be useful for understanding sporulation here. And the way it works is you take your genome of interest, every gene and you ask yes or no is there a homolog of that gene in another species for which you have the genome of and you make a big binary profile presence and absence of the genes in the genome across species and then you group genes not by their homology but by the similarity of their presence and absence profile across taxa so what you're basically doing is looking for genes that have shared distribution patterns across taxa and in bacteria and archaea, this is really important because bacteria and archaea, when they have a pathway, if they lose that pathway for some reason, they very rapidly lose all of the genes for that pathway. And so you get these um, sporulation disappears, they're going to be missing all the sporulation genes very fast in those organisms. Um, and bacteria and archaea also can acquire entire suites of functions by lateral gene transfer. And so you see this nice shared distribution pattern of genes that have similar functions spread across taxonomic groups rather than within a single individual taxonomic group. So we did this phylogenetic profile analysis for um, Carboxidothermus hydrogeniformans. We found these nice tight clusters that corresponded to genes found in sporulating species regardless of their phylogeny and not the non-sporulating species and we found lots of these annotated SPO genes in this list but we also found uh, 30 or so genes in these lists that no one had ever experimentally shown a function in any organism, annotated as hypothetical genes, even in the model spore-forming species that had been characterized in detail. These genes were there, not shown to be involved in sporulation. Um, to make a long story short, we then collaborated with one of the world's experts on sporulation in Bacillus subtilis, Richard Lozick, and um, they showed, and then we showed in collaboration with him, um, that basically all of these genes that were annotated as hypothetical proteins have some role in sporulation and that this was the best way to discover those genes. Many had not been flagged by biochemistry, many had not been flagged by genetic experiments, but this correlated distribution pattern of genes was a great way to find them across um, <coughs> organisms. Um, so uh, I'm going to switch. Um, uh, gears a little bit here, and again, another lesson, um, and you'll sense this in what I do is sort of returning to the same theme over and over and over and over. So again, if we go back to that map I was using, the Tree of Life, to guide my selection of organisms for DNA repair studies, 
Um, you can apply the same approach, which I did when I got to this genome center, to the genomes that were available. Pe what were people sequencing genomes? And it turns out most of the genomes from any one of the three domains of life came from a very narrow subselection of taxa, very phylogenetically biased. Um, we got a grant from NSF when I was there to fill in, um, to get the first genome from representatives of eight phyla of bacteria for which genomes were not available, but for which there were cultured species available in culture collections. And then when I moved to Davis, I got an adjunct appointment at the DOE Joint Genome Institute, and I convinced them to launch this project called the Genomic Encyclopedia of Bacteria and Archaea, where we took the ribosomal RNA tree of life and marched our way through the tree, finding lineages for which there were not genomes, and if there was a cultured species available from that group, they sequenced the genome of that um, organism, starting with the, you know, the, t the deepest branches in the tree and working our way out. Um, we showed through a series of analyses of this data that this was a very powerful way for discovering um, uh, new phylogenetic, new diversity of functions, not just, it's not just about sequencing novelty, it is a very powerful tool for um, annotating genomes, for discovering new protein families, for uh, learning a lot about uh, diversity of taxa, and we convinced many people in the community uh, that this was worth doing. Um, they had a spin-off project on cyanobacteria that they called the Giba Cyanobacteria Project, led by Cheryl Kerfeld at the JGI. We did a project on halophilic archaea, going back to my uh, interest in halophilic archaea, and we published one paper and another paper just came out a, a month or so ago on a sampling of 60 genomes from across the diversity of halophilic archaea and what, showing what you can learn from doing that. Um, one big limitation of this uh, is that um, this was focused on cultured organisms, and most of the diversity of bacteria and archaea and in fact, uh, eukaryotes and viruses is in organisms that have never been grown in the lab. So uh, Tanya Wojcicki at the JGI launched a project to try and get genomes from uncultured branches in the tree of life. There are many different strategies for doing this. What they focused on was flow sorting single cells, identifying single cells that came from novel lineages, and then doing whole genome amplification and single cell genomics from those uh, individual cells. They called this the JGI Dark Matter Project, MDM, the Microbial Dark Matter Project, and they showed all sorts of uh, functional diversity and interesting things that can come from sampling across the um, tree of life for genomes. We tried, I note, we tried to convince them to do the Genomic Encyclopedia of Microbes to include this third branch, you know, those things with nuclei that are kind of icky. Um, uh, we didn't convince them uh, uh, because their genomes tend to be larger. As an aside, um, I did collaborate when I was a tiger with Ed Arias and other people at UCSB on sequencing uh, the tetrahymena genome, and I've been really interested in filling in the eukaryotic tree of life, but we've still never been able to get funding to do that, um, and someone probably should do this for uh, viruses. Um, so in the last couple of minutes, uh, I just wanted to switch over, and um, I know I've, it's sort of conflicting lessons here. Uh, obsess about something, obsession is good, focus and return to the focus, but don't use the same uh, stick for everything. Um, and uh, although I love phylogeny and we try to apply phylogenetic approaches to just about everything we do, uh, it doesn't always work. So um, if we're going to environmental samples and doing shotgun sequencing from those environmental samples and trying to characterize communities, we do this in human gut samples, we do this on various plants and animals, we do this on free living communities. The biggest challenge that we have is making sense out of this data. We can now, with methods that we and other people have developed, figure out what tax are in those samples and compare the structure of communities to each other. We can figure out what genes are in those samples and figure out what the genetic potential is for some communities. But what we really need to do is connect the taxa to the genes. And that's going to be the way to actually do biology of these communities and ecology and integrate with other information that we have about um, these communities. And so there's a general approach that people refer to called binning, where we try and sort through this environmental data and piece it together into large clusters of sequences or bins that correspond to individual taxa from that sample. We have shown that phylogeny is one way for doing this binning, but um, it doesn't answer all of the problems for sorting through the environmental data. 
And one thing that we've been working on in my lab is other approaches rather than just phylogeny of everything to sorting through this environmental data. So we have a paper that just came out uh, uh, mid last year that a grad student in my lab, Chris Patel, in collaboration with Aaron Darling, um, when he was in my lab and now in Australia and a few other people on using this um, high C method, which many people use in studies of chromosome dynamics to look at things like um, chromatin uh, cores in eukaryotes. You can cross-link the DNA within a cell and detect which B DNA pieces within a cell are physically close to each other within that cell by then uh, creating libraries where you sequence the adjacent pieces that have been cross-linked together. Turns out you can do the same thing with metagenomics. You can take a population of cells. We did this with just a simulated community. Run high C on that population of cells and you get cross-links within each individual cell. And now that gives us our bin. That is our way of basically assembling the DNA from the community and connecting phylogenetic marker genes, which are sporadic around the genome, to all the functional genes that we're interested in and thereby being able to connect function and phylogeny from environmental samples. Um, and I thought I would just end in the last minute here um, with an example of another uh, way of doing this. This is work from a past graduate student of mine, Lizzie Wilbanks, who's now a postdoc uh, at Caltech, and she is coming to UCSB uh, March 2nd and 3rd to interview for one of these jobs that you've heard about. Um, she, I don't normally distinguish between graduate students, but she is the most brilliant, amazing <laughs> student. I, she was just astonishing in every way, integrating across lots of different information. She became, you know, she's like me, she became obsessed with something. She became obsessed with these, what she calls pink berry microbial communities that have been a model for studying microbial diversity at the Woods Hole microbial diversity course. They have really interesting sulfur metabolism cycling going on in this consortium of microbes. She did a lot of work characterizing the sulfur uh, movement within these. She collaborated with Vicki Orphan at Caltech to um, track the movement of sulfur within individual cells using this uh, nanosims method, nanoscale um, mass spec method. Um, but I'm not going to tell you about that in detail because she'll be here uh, in a few weeks. What I just wanted to mention is that we also worked with her. Um, she worked on another method for trying to bin environmental data, which is to use long sequence reads rather than short reads. The longer the read that we get from a community, the more we're able to connect functional genes to phylogenetic marker genes and then sort out the information from the community. So she took these berries, used a method from a company called Moleculo, um, which gets you basically long sequence reads from the community. Um, she also did random shotgun sequencing from the community and also did Pacific Biosciences sequencing from the community. And in particular, the collaboration with Pacific Biosciences led to um, development of novel methods for binning data based upon the methylation of the DNA sequence, not just on the sequence itself. Um, and uh, we have incredible assemblies that she's generated from these communities, and lo and behold, something we had ignored in the shotgun data. In one of the assemblies from one of these sulfate-reducing bacteria, we find a homolog of this proteorhodopsin gene. Um, returning to proteorhodopsin now, she built evolutionary trees of the proteorhodopsins. This proteorhodopsin is in a group for which the experimental details had not been characterized. She collaborated with one of the proteorhodopsin experts, Susumo Yoshizawa, who has now shown function of this particular um, proteorhodopsin and appears to be a light responsive sulfate reducer, which is a novel function within the proteorhodopsin family. And we would never have even pursued this sequence without having phylogenetic marker genes on some of these contigs and big assemblies that then said, this is from the organism that she has the nanosims data for that we know the function of. Um, and so I will uh, end it there and just say that um, the last lesson uh, which I can talk to people about later is asking for and getting help is a good thing. So one of the things we're doing a lot now of is engaging in citizen science and crowdsourcing for microbial studies. Um, we're doing it both in our research projects and in other projects, but I'm not going to go into that in detail. Um, and I'll just end with my, my real obsession, which is I'm a recovering birder. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's what got me interested in biology and natural history, and I want to make a field guide to the microbes to go along with the field guide to birds. And I will leave it there.
much, Dr. Eisen. Um, we have about 13 minutes for questions before we go to break, 12 minutes now. So um, anybody, you're welcome to ask any questions about the wonderful lessons we've been given. Yeah. Just, um, so you, have you had much success applying this to the viral? Yeah, so the question is, have I had much success applying this to the virome? So um, we have not fo focused much at all on viral sequences. For certain environmental samples, we get the viruses at the same time as we get everything else. So soil, for example, we do total DNA extraction from soil samples, and there are viruses in those DNA products. For water samples, we're usually filtering with a 0.2 micron filter, and most of the, well, the smaller viruses go through. So we haven't, for, for many of our studies, we have not focused on viruses. I skipped over it, but um, we've been collaborating with people trying to build um, markers for all the different viral lineages. It's much more complicated because of the diversity in viruses, and each viral clade has different conserved housekeeping genes that could serve as phylogenetic markers. So we, we haven't gotten... Uh, deeply into viruses, except in the rare cases where we ended up with some of them in our assemblies or in other data. But it is, it is the mo one of the most important and biggest gaps in what we and other people are doing. Yeah, in the back. Well, so, so for the protein family diversity, the most useful thing to do is to take experimentally determined functions for a group of genes that you're interested in and analyze first how they splay out on the phylogeny of that protein family. And only then is it you know, reasonable to say, if they map onto the phylogeny in a characteristic way, can we use character state reconstruction methods or a likelihood model or some other thing to predict the functions for that particular gene? And I actually, for my DNA repair work, I actually showed that there were some families that this worked well with and some that it did not work well with. The ones that it did not work well with were, I mean, you may be thinking of these, but there are many um, protein families where the specificity of function changes with one amino acid change in a binding pocket of the protein. The phylogeny of those are not, they're, they're somewhat suggestive in some cases, but generally not that useful. So the best thing to do, and what, I mean, I didn't go into this detail, this is what I spent kind of eight years working on at Tiger, was we um, built a database called Tiger Fams, which we went through protein families, overlaid the known experimentally determined functions on them, and then if there were clades, where the function was conserved within the clade, but not between the clades, we built hidden Markov models for that clade that then served as a possible way to predict the functions. So I completely agree, for protein family diversity, you need to integrate with real information. For species, um, we generally don't any longer try to predict biological function from where an organism sits in the species tree because it changes so fast. Now that's not always the case. So for example, most cyanobacteria are photoautotrophic. So there are some clades where you can predict some of the functions of those species based upon membership in those clades. But you always, you always should be integrating the, the known information about the history in order to then see if you can make a prediction. I completely agree. Yeah. So you mentioned this thing at the end about um, getting people involved in citizen science. And a lot of the stuff you talked about involves sequencing. Yeah. Sequencing per base pair has gotten really, really cheap, but sequencing experiments are still quite expensive. And this is an open-ended question. Yeah. So does this, how does this relate to the citizen science? And so, so sequencing per experiment actually is not expensive anymore. Um, so for example, for microbes now. Um, oh, I took out the slides on our space microbe project. So. Um, We've, we have a project called Project Mercury where we've been collaborating with a group uh, called Science Cheerleaders to go around to public events like sporting events around the country. <laughs> and we've collected swabs from, we actually had people at these events come up to a counter and do swabbing of their shoes and phones and also of the site where the event is. And each of those swabs, 
to do ribosomal RNA sequencing from one of those swabs, from, from buying the swabs all the way to the end of the sequencing is about $25. But that's because they're bundled. Yeah, the that's actual, right. So, yeah. so we pool them. So the individual people can't do right. that themselves. What um, what we do is we barcode them and then run all of them pooled together onto a single run of a MySeq machine or something to that effect. Um, what I'm hoping develops in the next year or two is um, companies that will do this as a service and do the pooling for people. Yeah. There are two right now big companies in the U.S. that do so-called crowdsourcing of human microbiome studies. There's one called American Gut, which is like an open, uh, open science project run by Rob Knight and Jack Gilbert and a few others. And you can sign up for that. They'll send you a kit. You send it back. They will sequence it and send you your data. And then there's a company called Ubiome that's sort of the corporate version of this. Um, and they're doing basically the same thing. Um, and it's about $90 to $100 per sample. So anybody can send in a sample and get back the data at about $90 to $100. We're, we're hoping to push it a little lower and to make it such that anybody could do this in a high school science class or it's not quite there with a, as a service economy yet. Yeah. So you mentioned the, you like your shotgunning Yeah, so this is a great question. So the question is basically, I, I said I really like the shotgun sequencing, and yet the database for protein sequences is much more limited than the database for ribosome RNA. And this is, that's the biggest challenge right now. So actually, the real reason I launched the phylogenetic sampling of genomes, this project at Tiger, and then the Genome Encyclopedia project at JGI, and now the Dark Matter project, is to fill in the sequence diversity of protein family space to enable us to be able to go to environmental communities and make more sense of them. And so um, it's still nowhere near the data that we have for ribosomal RNA. So it's a balance. We actually do both for most samples. Ribosome RNA is um, cheaper per sample. Uh, it's, there's trillions of sequences to compare to. The PCR primers work pretty well. And we know how to analyze the data because so many people are analyzing it. Um, but it doesn't give us functional information. The functional predictions from taxonomic position are not very good. And its estimates of relative abundance are actually not great for some taxa. So we do both, actually. We do metagenomic sequencing and ribosome RNA sequencing. And it, because sequencing has gotten so cheap, we're shifting more to the metagenomic sequencing because we can do <coughs> more. But we still, I, I should have said, we, we, we should do both. Because um, that's what we do for actually every study that we're working on. OK, so if there are no more questions. Can we thank Dr. Eisen one more time?